Hello coders, this is Jared with Renaissance Coders and in this video we are going to take a look at Writer, a new .NET IDE from JetBrains that we can use for Unity development. Writer is still in the early build phase so we can get an early build from the JetBrains website here that I will link to in the description below. One of our community members suggested that we take a look at Writer. And I have to say that I am glad that he made the suggestion. I downloaded the most recent build available, which is EAP Build 22. Before we get into the installation, though, let's cover what Rider really is. Now, based on the information from JetBrains' website, Rider is a full-fledged cross-platform .NET IDE. Rider works on a variety of frameworks and with a variety of languages, so it is looking good so far. Rider works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, which is really nice for everybody. It has an intelligent code editor, and the intelligent code editor does code completion, auto-importing of namespaces, and rearranging code, for example. Rider has code analysis that completes live code inspections that helps to detect errors and code smells, and shortcuts to quickly fix errors. Based on the website, it looks like Rider also has some really powerful searching features. Another feature of Rider is that it has a decompiler that allows us to go to the declaration of some code within a file that you are working on. Along with the decompiler, we also have the ability to refactor code and perform unit tests. We also have the ability to complete debugging, and based on what I have seen so far, it looks like we will, we will be able to attach Rider to Unity for debugging. The application is definitely pretty cool, and I really like the initial startup options that they include with the first startup of the application. When first opening the application, we have the option to import Rider settings from a previous version, which I did not have, so I skipped this step. The next option that we have is to set up the UI theme. We have two options here, the default theme, which looks pretty boring, and the Dracula theme, which is awesome. Next, we can choose our editor color scheme. We have three options here, the ReSharper Dark, Visual Studio Dark, or the Dracula theme. I again went with Dracula, of course. Next, we move on to our key map scheme. This basically gives us the capability to choose which shortcuts you would like to use. I stayed with the Visual Studio key map option. Next, we have the option to tune Rider to your tasks. Basically, this allows us to choose what functionalities we would like to include within our application. I again left this set to the defaults. Next, we can download featured plugins. For this option, I did choose to install the ReSharper Unity plugin, which installed really quickly. I looked away for like five seconds, and when I looked back, it had already installed, which was really cool. And on the last page that we come to, we just see some links to additional information around Rider the issue tracker, and some known issues. I do want to make a note here that you can skip the initial options when completing this startup if you wish, but I like to work with pretty IDEs, so I rather enjoyed the initial startup questions. Okay, now that we have covered the installation process, let's get into what it is actually like to use the application. So I've got Rider just in the initial screen set up over here, and I've got Unity set up in the background. And I'm actually gonna go in and change my Unity preferences first, and I'm just gonna change my external tools to point to Rider. You are going to have to browse for Rider, and on Mac it should be under your applications directory. Hopefully I can just type in Rider. There we go. And it should update here. Very cool. Now what I actually want to try and do first is actually open a script here and just see how well it interprets a Unity file just from opening it directly from Unity. So let's go ahead and double click. As we can see it says it's loading components, loading the project. So I think it's actually going to launch our, S our solution or SLN file based on the feedback it was showing me there. And I don't think it's doing anything. Okay, let's double click again and see what happens. I don't see it. Let's try Lurper. Nothing. Okay, so it looks like you might actually have to open up a solution file directly. So luckily I've already got my solutions file here, so I can just click on it. And here we go. Now again, it's just telling me that it's loading the project, says it's scanning for files to index. Looks like it's opened up a cur color Lurper. And I believe I was actually working in this earlier, so that's pro probably why it's got this open. So if I close that out, if you look over to the left, you can see that it is pulling in the project name, assembly C sharp assets and scripts. So you will have to sort of toggle down to get to those. We can easily double click on a script we've been working on and it automatically populates everything that we're gonna need. It also looks like it has some pretty robust grouping tools, you know, so it's got the using statement actually grouped together. So we can easily toggle that down in the start function, things like that. Really easy to do that, which is nice. One thing that we do see here is the Unity logo. And if we hover over that, it basically just says Unity event function and start is called on the frame. So it just gives you a little more uh, information about the functions. If we hover up top here, and this sort of 
confuses me a little bit. Maybe you coders know a little more about this, but it says name should shake, which is this Boolean value here, does not match rule fields not private suggests the name is should shake. So basically what it's saying is that this should be capitalized, which is a little confusing to me. I don't know if that's necessarily like a a uh, rule with C sharp or with it with unity or anything like that. But this definitely threw me for a loop because it's kind of showing up as like a little bit of a warning, which is a little distracting, but that's okay. The other thing we can look at here is this Unity logo again, and it again just says that this field is initialized by Unity. So that basically means that these fields here are actually going to show up in Unity. So let's see what this actually does as far as autofilling. So if I just enter a few spaces here, I can just create another public and let's, let's throw it a Quaternion first. Nice. So it immediately picked up on that. Let's see if it gets game object. Oops. Oh, good lord public game object. Okay, so it looks like it's doing the auto population pretty well. The IntelliSense is definitely working. Okay, and so one thing that I ran into with the Visual Studio IDE that really frustrated me was the get component function. You know, that function just seemed to not populate very well and sort of drew me, drove me crazy. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna set up a rigid body, RB, and we're also gonna set up a public game object, and we're just gonna call this reference or just ref. And what I want to do now is say that, um, what's actually giving me, oh, I can't call it ref, of course, call it reference. There we go. And now let's say that RB is equal to reference dot get component. Oh my God, it did it. That is so beautiful. That's what we like to see. Okay. So it does the angle brackets and automatically requests that you fill those out. So let's just say rigid body here. Awesome. So that it just immediately, I love this, you know, it's amazing. Okay. So I'm actually going to undo all the changes I've made here because <laughs> I do use this script. Now, one thing I did want to actually show you was the decompiler. So earlier I said that it would show us uh, like the origins of some code. So what we can do is we can actually select something and then right click on it. And after right clicking, we can look at go to and declaration. And when we do this, it's going to uh, basically pull up where camera is defined in Unity. And as you can see here, it's actually saying it was decompiled, decompiled with a JetBrains decompiler and uh, the type is UnityEngine.Camera. So right now we're actually looking at uh, Unity's camera code, which is really amazing. This is really powerful and I could see myself using this a lot. Obviously there's gonna be a lot of stuff in here but it's just really cool, you know, to look at something like this. Like, so we can see the getter and the setter for the background color of the camera, the rect, um, you know, just a lot of really cool stuff in here that we can do. Okay, the next thing I actually want to go through is uh, the settings for this application. So let's go up to Rider EAP in the top, and we're going to click on our preferences. And as you can see, we just have a typical preferences window here, and we can look at things like appearance and behavior toggle that down. Let's click on our appearance and we can see our UI theme, which is Dracula or default, which we would have set in our initial setup or launch of the application. You can change things like the um, red and green for vision deficiency. You can toggle the windows op window options for like animating the windows and things like that. Uh, let's look at the menus and toolbars. Again, this is going to be pretty deep. You know, there's a lot of stuff in here and we can select one and we can add after, add a separator, do all sorts of stuff in here, you know, just really, really cool stuff. And this is actually basically our menu. So if I click on file, it's gonna show some open actions, things like that. So very cool stuff going on. Now, if we look at our editor, we can see that we've got a lot more stuff going on under here. And if we look at general, we can see that it's gonna honor camel humps, pretty important stuff going on. We've got use soft wraps in editor. So we, if we have a line that's really long, it will automatically wrap for us. Just a lot, a lot of stuff in here, you know. So this editor seems to be really opened up and allowing us to change a lot of different things. So we can also look at like the colors and fonts. And of course I'm using the Resharper Dark here, but we can change it to like Dracula if we wanted to. Save it. I don't think it's gonna change automatically. I think we actually have to exit and reload. Oh no, wow, it changes automatically, awesome. Yeah. That is cool. I'm not a big fan of the way it's doing the highlighting around that. That's not very pretty. Let's open up our preferences again. Now under our colors and fonts, we can actually change this quite a bit, which is something that Visual Studio did not have. So if I go back to, uh, well, let's just leave it on Dracula. And we can look at our font here. Of course, it's using Menlo, which I actually like. 
We can up the size, line spacing. We can use a secondary font if we wish, but I'm not gonna do that. We can look at the general for it. And this just shows us sort of the rules that are applied to this theme. And as you can see here, we've got a warning, which is just sort of showing that it's going to be highlighted like that. And I think I could actually delete this maybe, no. Let's get rid of the background on it. Okay. So yeah, so when you want to update it, you can just uh, select something over here and then change it. We can also look at the language defaults. So obviously we're gonna have quite a few defaults within different languages and things like that. So that's pretty cool. We can look at the debugger and this is gonna be like inserting breakpoints, uh, execution points, things like that. So again, pretty cool stuff. You can look at CSS, uh, JSON, less. I don't really see C sharp in here. We can put, click on our ASP.NET, see what this is doing. I don't really see a Unity option in here either. That's okay though. The big point here is that they do allow you to easily manipulate and update themes, which is really, really cool. So let's go back up to our general warning, no background, and let's save that. Very cool, so we got rid of that. It's still giving me. Okay, yeah, so that's a warning that I know, you know, I do this in all my videos just to let everyone know that it should be set to false, but it does set things to false initially, so that's okay. Now let's open up our preferences one last time. And we're gonna go out of editor. I don't think there's anything else. Yeah, so we're gonna go out of editor here. We do have the capability to look at the plugins. Obviously, I've got a lot of plugins installed by default. You can see I've also got the Unity support. You could do a JetBrains plugin, browse repositories, or install from disk. We also have the version control capabilities within here. So you could uh, specify projects. Uh, you could limit the history being shown commit message on the right hand side, things like that. So again, very cool stuff. Let's look at the tools now. None of this is really relevant to what we do. We look at web browsers. Okay, so that's just showing us the available web browsers. Now let's go through the top line, see if there's anything else in here we need to go through. Typical file, edit, view, cool buttons. Let's see what this does. Oh wow, it just adds a whole bunch of GUIs. All right, active editor, show white spaces. Oh, okay, cool, so that's sort of Sublime Text sort of does the same thing, kind of, not really. So we could clean this up quite a bit to get rid of that. We can look at our code, override methods, implement methods, things like that. So I could actually select this and we could generate. And when I click on, when I click generate, it allows us to do constructors, read only properties, properties, overriding members and everything like that. So this will basically help us to build something out very quickly. So let's actually enter twice and let's generate. And let's see what they have for the unity event functions. See if I can make this a little bit bigger. Very nice. Okay, so as we can see, it's automatically giving us a lot of these functions that we can automatically generate. So I can actually just click a few. Let's see here. We don't need this. On become visible. Nice. On destroy. So yeah, they've got a lot of stuff in here. You could do on trigger enter, exit, stay. Okay, so I've selected, what, six of these? So let's see what happens when I click OK. Nice. <laughs> I don't know what that's, what this is saying, but... Oh, it's just the constructor. Okay. So yeah, it's just sort of dynamically populating these methods for us. So it's just a quicker way so you don't have to write these all out yourself. Just very cool little options that we have in here. But I do, again, want to go back out and just select a different script from my editor here just to see what happens. So let's double click on one and boom, automatically, automatically opened really quickly. Very nice. So much like the Visual Studio IDE, this does have to have the solution file opened. I did notice a few issues when I was trying to open a file without having the solution file open. It took a lot longer to open, which was kind of frustrating, but again, that's okay. You know, this, this application gives us a lot of power and a lot of different things we can do. That's cool. So it automatically gathered that all of these, even though this is three different functions, it found that those are actually commented out, so I could easily just toggle all of those down. That's very cool. And of course, it's telling me I don't have to use this here, so I could 
get rid of it. So this is kind of cool that it's giving us, you know, just sort of some feedback around, you know, that this is redundant. You know, you don't have to set this again, you know. So this IDE is really cool. I do I do want to make a point here that uh, you do get a trial when you do the EAP. So I think mine expires like in a week or maybe two weeks, something like that. So you do have to actually pay for this application when it, when it will be released. Um, but it is a really nice application. So one thing that I would say against this IDE is that when I do a command plus thinking, oh, this is going to increase the size of my font. It doesn't do that, which is kind of annoying. You know, it's not uh, not very cool that it doesn't do that. Let's see if I can do that very easily. Edit. See if there's a shortcut to do that. And I don't see that in here. So that's another thing against this application is that it's not really giving me some of those basic options like, you know, command plus to increase the size of the font, things like that. But I think Xcode just added that in, you know, during this most recent WWDC. So, I mean, it's not like all the IDEs have that except for this one, you know. Okay, coders, that's actually going to do it for this review. I don't know what is in the water at JetBrains, but they have definitely stepped things up a notch or two. I remember a couple years ago that their IDEs were not all that awesome, but then again, there really were not all that many great IDEs back in the day. JetBrains has definitely stepped it up, though. I strongly suggest checking out their new line of IDEs. They have quite a few of them, and I have used a couple of them, like RubyMine and PHP Storm before, and they're both really cool. I may complete another review after a week or so with this IDE to see if I still like it or not, but something tells me that I'll still like it and I do just really quickly want to go back out to the website and just show you guys that you can go to like their all tools and you can just sort of see all the stuff they've got going you know there's a lot of really cool stuff in here and I think they actually have a deal for students um, you know, so if you are a student, you may be able to get these at a discounted rate or something like that. I, I don't know for sure, so don't quote me on that, but I think that is a thing with these guys. But again, that's going to do it for this review. Please be sure to subscribe and drop us a like if you enjoyed this video. And as always, thanks for watching.